what it comes down to is I'm seeing more misdiagnosis. And they're misdiagnosis not because it was like a really complicated problem, but because like we weren't even really in the ballpark. And when, and when we make a diagnosis where we're not really in the ballpark, that means that we're guessing. That means that you're getting frustrated and you're just saying, um, bah, it's probably the compressor. Bah, it's probably the board. Bah, it's probably leaking the coil. Whatever the case may be, right? Um, and that's a really, really bad trait. It's not something you want to engage. You want to you want to start going down that path because it leads to it leads to bad things. Because the, and the reason why you start to do it is because you do it a few times and you get away with it. And it's just like I don't want to know the story with this compressor. I'm hearing you guys grumbling about this, whatever. Um, but just like with what's going on here, there, there seems to be some lack of clarity about what happened here. And that is not an acceptable way to run a service business. Like, it's just not, it's not okay. It's not, eh, well, maybe, uh, you know, oh, uh, well, okay, crap happens. That's not the sort of mindset that we need to have towards diagnosis, okay? And that is a little bit of a Kalos thing that's starting to creep in, which is just sort of like, well, there's so much expected of us, you know, phew, you're just going to make bad diagnosis sometimes, and that's just how it is. And that's not how you think about that any more than you think that way about failing an inspection. Do you, with the failing an inspection, you don't have the mindset of, oh, well, you know, an inconvenience is the customer, we have to go back another day, uh, you know, whatever. That's not, that's not how you think about that, right? Or not how you should. And the same thing is true with diagnosis. So we're not always gonna get it right, and we're not always gonna pass every inspection. Okay, so that's, that's a given. But if you're this reason why we didn't get it right or we didn't pass the inspection, then you shouldn't be comfortable with that in yourself. And I don't care if you don't, if, if it's not a Kalos thing, think of it as a personal development thing. If you get the mindset of being okay with letting things go that are incorrect, then that's going to follow you. And 10 years down the road, you're gonna be one of these grouchy old technicians who says, oh, I just busted my butt my whole life and I don't know why I'm, oh, I'll never get any opportunities. You know, you hear this all the time um, from people who don't hold themselves to a high standard. So don't make this about me. Don't make this about comparing yourself to somebody else. Because that's a, and now at Kalos, there's some pretty good people to compare yourself to. There are some really great uh, people here. But even that, don't compare yourself to another person because then you're always gonna have an excuse as well. Like for example, if I run a service call and I forget to quote a drain line or fail to quote a drain line when it should have been quoted and I get a call back, that was my mistake, I should own it, but that's not an excuse for somebody else to get a call back. That, may have, that, may, that scenario may have exa exactly happened. You get the point. So what should happen is you should tell me, hey, why did you quote that drain line? And I should say, what? What should my response be when I didn't quote the drain line and it results in a callback? What? Bad. It should be, yeah, I should, have, I should have quoted that. Good catch. Thank you for telling me, right? Because there's something to learn there. It's not, oh yeah, well, that one install you did, blah, 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 or whatever, whatever comeback <laughs> that we want to have. And there is a little bit of that. It's, it's a societal thing, but it's also a, a theme that I'm seeing grow in Kalos culture, which is rather than just saying, it doesn't matter if somebody else isn't doing what they're supposed to do, I need to do what I'm supposed to do. So from in terms of diagnosis, you have to care about getting the diagnosis right. Not necessarily about at the end of the day, I mean, you know, it's, it's more important at the end of the day that the customer has air conditioning, obviously, but you can do, be a really bad diagnostician and get the customer air conditioning at the end of the day. You can just keep, you know, loading the parts cannon and firing parts at the unit, you know, <clears throat> till it starts working. And that's not how we do diagnosis. So I'm going to talk about some key areas that when you run into these situations, I want you to pause. I want you to think a little bit more about what you're doing before you move on. And one of the first and biggest is the compressor. So what we're wanting to prevent is the cop-out attitude, the attitude of, well, I gotta get on to the next call, somebody's pushing me. Um, that's a cop-out attitude to, to not make a good diagnosis. And then also the unwillingness to take feedback attitude. It doesn't matter how much you don't wanna hear feedback from a particular person. Um, it doesn't matter if you don't respect them, you know, because this happens sometimes in work that you may work with people you don't totally respect. If what they're telling you is correct, then you need to hear it and you need to learn from it. That's just how it is. It doesn't matter if you like them personally. It doesn't matter if you, you know, hang out on the weekends. It matters if what they're telling you is something you can learn from.
Everybody agree with that? That's Preach, just a general preacher. concept. That's a good general concept. We can all live that way, right? All right, me, everybody. All right, so let's talk about compressors here. Let's start with, um, th there's, really, there's really three primary uh, types of compressor failure. What happens when a compressor is open? Anybody know? Let's start here. Do we have an open circuit between these two probes right now? Yes. 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 Now do we have an open circuit between these two probes? No, now we have a closed circuit, right? Open circuit, closed circuit. What do we call a closed circuit that is an undesigned closed circuit, meaning that you're, you're making a circuit that's not supposed to be there? Short. We call that a short, right? And it's a very simple why we call it a short, because it's taking an undesigned path. It's taking a path that you're not expecting or that you, you know, hadn't hoped it would take, right? It's a short. It's, 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 it's not taking the long way. It's taking a short way. Got that? All right. So. That first category that you both uh, mentioned, a burnout and insulation compromise, that is a short circuit. And the most common short circuit by far is what we call a short to ground or a grounded compressor. Okay. Now, why do compressors ground? Rub outs and overheating. Yeah, so internally, yeah, so overheating can cause it. Um, or loss of oil can cause it. Loss of lubrication can cause it. Those are the two of the biggest reasons why that occurs. And so inside this compressor, you've got a motor and you've got a pump, basically. A compressor is a form of a pump. It moves refrigerant around, right? And in this compressor particularly, you also have suspension. So this whole compressor is suspended inside of this shell. And so when refrigerant comes down this suction line into the compressor, suction line in, discharge line out, comes in vapor, it literally just dumps into this shell. If you were to look on the other side of this suction line, what you would see is just an opening. It just dumps into the shell. And then the compressor pumps out of the shell out of the discharge line. Okay, follow that? So if something happens inside this compressor where maybe the suspension breaks, you know, you heard those springs that the compressor's sitting on, say that suspension breaks. But what's gonna happen inside that compressor? Just from a practical standpoint. It'll start banging all over the place, right? And what will happen eventually after it's banged around long enough? the windings will become compromised, right? You're gonna damage the windings. And once you damage the windings, those windings can either short to the shell or they can short to one another. And regardless, what is that gonna to lead to? That's going to lead to an undesigned path of lower resistance than it was designed to have, okay? Lower resistance equals higher amperage or higher current. A short circuit results in primarily trip breaker blown fuse. That's what we see most often, right? So you walk up to a job, Trip breaker, blown fuse. Now, is a shorted compressor the only thing that can cause a trip breaker or a blown fuse? No. Lots of other things can cause it. Crankcase heater that's shorted out. It could be a, a breaker that's that's you know that's failed. Could be. Could be a, a rubbed out wire. It could be a what's that? Loose connection. Could be could be a loose connection in some cases. Sure. Bad contact. <laughs> could be bad contact. We found that. Yeah, that was a weird one. Really weird one actually. Because there's lots of things that can cause it. So at the end of the day, if you look, we're going to jump straight to the conclusion here. I'm going to jump straight to the punchline. End of the day, you think this compressor is shorted. What is the very last thing you need to do? Aaron, you, you go to a job on a weekend, and you think you, you are darn sure the compressor is shorted. Breaker was tripping, so you think it was shorted. And you're about ready to write it up. You're about ready to put it into the parts channel so that we quote a new compressor. What is the very last thing you need to do before you walk away from that job? Isolate it. You need to isolate it, see. take the leads off of the compressor. See if everything turns on, does it trip? Exactly. Tape those leads up really well, not to each other, separately. <laughs> <laughs> Tape those leads up really well so they're independently isolated. Put everything back together and reset that breaker. Should the breaker reset? Yes, because you're saying that the compressor is shorted, and if the compressor is shorted, if the compressor is isolated, then the unit should power up. Now, of course, the compressor's not going to run, obviously, because it's isolated. But everything else should run. The fan motor should run, contactor should pull in, everything else should be fine, right? Does that make sense? This isn't a suggestion. This isn't like a quick tip for living well. This is every time you diagnose a shorted compressor, you do that as your final step. Every single time. Now, you may add, that when I say your final step, your final diagnostic step. The next step, if you know you're going to do the compressor, I would suggest that we go ahead and weigh the charge out right now. 
why would we weigh the charge out right now before we even go to get the compressor or do anything else? See if it's low or if it's overcharged. Because if it's low or overcharged, either one of those can result in a failed compressor, and you kind of want to know that. Because if it was overcharged, hmm, maybe somebody was compensating for low airflow. Maybe it has a bad valve, right? If it's undercharged, ugh, maybe we have a leaking evaporator coil or a leak somewhere else. And now you know that before you walk away from that job, and then you put the new compressor in the customer, you fire it up and then find out that it's, you know, it's not working. That's a, that's a pretty un uncomfortable conversation, I would say. So does that make sense? Everybody get that? It's not hard to do. It's your final step every time. You will look like a genius, right? Because you'll go up and you'll be like, I'm, I'm sure it's the compressor. You do all that, and then bam, it trips the breaker again. Oh, then you start looking again. Oh, man, the crankcase heater. This is a trained compressor. So I don't know if you guys have ever seen this, but there's a well down at the bottom of this compressor that, a, that an insertion rod, a cow rod style crankcase heater goes into. These suckers are known for breaking apart and shorting out. To run to an older train compressor, that's something that definitely happens quite often. Another thing, the other reason why I want you doing it this way is that it forces you to actually look at the terminal. Nothing makes me crazier than somebody who diagnoses a shorted compressor and they didn't actually even pull the top off to see the terminals to make sure that there's not a short at the terminals themselves. You guys all get that? So that's mostly what I wanted to say about a shorted compressor. Now let's move into the, the diagnostic part quickly. I'm not going to go into the different um, ohm readings on the compressor, um, though in the video we'll flash up the little you know common ohm readings that you see. Because really, as far as the standard ohm readings, people will say things like uh, start and run is uh, equal to start plus common, uh, or sorry, a start and common and run and common put together. Well, that's a fairly obvious statement. That's not really a diagnostic test. Like I don't really know why people do that. It's not really a helpful diagnostic test. What you're primarily looking for when you're looking for a shorted compressor is you're going from the terminal, with the terminal isolated, to the copper on the compressor. A nice, solid, scratched out spot on your discharge line where you're kind of making sure you're getting good contact and you're seeing do you have a path between these terminals and ground. Now, like we mentioned before, a short is any undesigned path of low resistance that causes high current, right? Low resistance causes high current. So it isn't necessarily shorted to ground, though that is the most common. And when we say shorted to ground, a lot of people in the trade freak out and say, that's grounded. Grounded is its own thing. Grounded, shorted to ground, a short to ground, whatever you want to say, it's an undesigned path to ground. It's a, it is a short. It's a type of short. But you could have a short where the windings themselves, especially in a compressor that's in suspension like this, where it's actually pretty far away from the shell, where the windings themselves are just all melted together. And that can also cause a short. The problem is that short's very hard to find by measuring in between the terminals. Okay. Let's prevent a big mistake that a lot of you make. You go from terminal to terminal with your ohm meter, and you measure, and you see a really low ohm reading. If you see a, and by the way, this one is showing open terminal to terminal right now. Yeah, so there, this, this compressor is actually open. Who said that it, was, that it wasn't failed? It's this guy? All right, so terminal to terminal, you should read an ohm reading. But the problem is, is that you think you know what that ohm reading should be, and you don't. That's the problem. And so you say, oh, it's drawn five ohms. It's drawing. It's <laughs> measuring five ohms. <laughs> I'm using weird language here. It's measuring five ohms from start to run. That seems low. That seems high. Well, there is no seams. You don't know. Unless you know the specs for this compressor, you don't know what ohm reading you should see. Now, there are there ranges where, of course, you know it's too high. It's reading the mega ohm scale, for example. You know, where it's reading, you know, 0.1 ohms. Yeah, okay, at that point, yes. But even then, your meters, a lot of meters, don't read well in the really low ohm range. This is something that we've learned recently. Some meters will just go to zero even when it's 0.2 or 0.3. And some compressors will have 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 ohms range between the run and common winding, the lowest ohm winding. Here's the point. Ohming from leg to leg, like this, helps you know whether or not you have an open, like this compressor has. So meaning that the windings are broken or the thermal overload is open. So it helps you see that. But getting a reading on this doesn't necessarily indicate to you uh, that there's, it doesn't really tell you much, I guess, unless you're very experienced with that particular compressor or unless you pull up the compressor spec sheet to see what the ohms are. Who here, when diagnosing a compressor, has pulled up the compressor spec sheet to see what the ohms are in the process of diagnosis? 
It's a pretty small number of technicians do that. So unless you have done that, and I definitely suggest it, get the Copeland mobile app, look up the spec sheet from you know, Bristol or whoever, you're, whoever the compressor is made by, Tyler, this is a Tyler compressor, um, and see what that is. But unless you've done that, you don't know what that should be. So the point being that that, that redneck test, we call it, where you, do, you isolate it and you reset the breaker, that's actually a really good test. Because if it was tripping the breaker before, then you isolate the compressor at the terminals and it stops tripping the breaker, guess what's wrong? The compressor. It's just that simple. And from you have a weak breaker. Is that a thing? Uh, okay, it's a good question. A weak breaker. So what does a weak breaker mean? What would that mean? I don't know, a 30 amp breaker that would trip at 17 amps. Thing. Sure, that can absolutely happen, but that's only gonna do it during run. Like all, all breakers that we use in air conditioning, they have, a, they have a measure of time delay in them. It's not like they're just gonna trip like that just because of start amps. That's not gonna happen. There's gonna be, now again, when I say it's not gonna happen, there's always the exception to the rule. Um, saying something has a weak breaker is kind of like when somebody says the system was leaking at the Schrader's. It's like one of those sort of cop-out diagnoses, or, or I think somebody was stealing the refrigerant from the system and that's why it was low. Like there are these weird excuses that people use in order to just kind of get away from the job because they don't want to figure out what it is. Is it possible that there could be a weak breaker? Yes, but you would only know that like over time after a series of uh, unfortunate events and weird diagnoses. Does that make sense? All right, so in terms of testing the compressor, the short is easy actually at the end of the day because you do that isolation test and that is a pass fail test at the end. Everybody get that? Okay, open is also simple, I just showed you. You go between terminals and you see, is it still reading OL? And if it is, it's open. Now, if it's open in between, this is always something to remember. So you do common, start, run. If it's open in between, your, com so your terminal is actually right here and there's a thermal overload in the circuit so if when you're measuring on your common terminal, this is actually the common point inside the compressor where the windings connect. So if you're measuring between common and run and you see an open, or start in common and you see an open, but when you measure between run and start, you measure a path, that's an indication that it's an open thermal overload. Your thermal overload is open, and that's just because it's overheated. And a lot of times when thermal overloads trip, they take a long time to reset. This is a common one where people say, well, hey, I waited an hour, I ran water on it for an hour and it still didn't reset. Yeah, it may take three or four hours in some cases. Because again, when that, once that trips, especially on a compressor like this with a big shell, a big heavy steel shell, there's a lot of thermal mass there and that compressor may take a while to reset. So don't condemn that compressor until you've given it enough time to be sure that it's actually cool to touch. If you touch that compressor and it's completely cold, okay, at that point, and it still hasn't reset, then you can go ahead and quote it. But even then, when you quote it, you tell the customer, this thing's out on thermal overload, it could reset at any moment. It's just not resetting for right now. So you can wait it out if you want, or we can go ahead and quote you a compressor. That makes sense? So a thermal overload is a category of open compressor. In the same way that a rounded compressor, or a burnout compressor, or a shorted compressor, or compromised windings, those are all terms for a short. So you have short, you have open, meaning no path, broken winding, open thermal overload, and then you have the next type of failure, which is what? Broken windings. <laughs> grand, grand, grand. What's the, next, what's the next category of compressor failure? Burn. Locked. Oops, locked. I forgot, I forgot uh, locked compressor. So there's actually four types. I was just joking when I said three. There's a, there's a locked compressor. And a locked compressor is what? What does that mean for a compressor to be locked? Seized, physically, doesn't, can't physically move inside. So if it's a scroll compressor, that means that something is preventing the scroll from orbiting. If it's a reciprocating compressor, it means that something's preventing the pistons from pumping, right? You like that? <laughs> pistons from pumping. Um, physically seized. And that makes sense, right? I mean, you have this, you have a machine, and if something breaks inside this machine or it's not lubricated properly, this corrosion, maybe it sat a really long time and there was moisture in the system because a proper vacuum wasn't pulled, it's, it, it could seize, right? And so when you have a seize compressor, what do you do? Hit it with a hammer. <laughs> yeah, you can hit it with a hammer. Um, I have hit them with hammers, but hammer actually doesn't create much force. Um, depending on the type of compressor, like a compressor like this, you hear it bounce around in there. So grabbing it by the suction line and giving it a good shake 
is actually probably going to be more effective than a hammer, or, or maybe you know, kind of getting a step stool and standing in there and giving it a couple kicks. Sometimes that will help. I'm not even joking. I, I see Josh looking at me like I'm like I'm making a joke here. It is actually. It's that. It's like a form of percussive maintenance. Yeah. So. Right. <laughs> percussive maintenance. Yeah. Hammer based maintenance. Exactly. <laughs> I like your vocabulary already. Um, and now again, that's generally going to only be effective with a compressor that's locked for a reason, like. It's been off for a long time. So pool heaters are a common one. They only run seasonally. They may be off for eight months, 10 months, 12 months. And now somebody tries to run it, and now it could just be physically seized because of the time factor there, right? So in that case, yeah, give her, give her a kick if you want. <laughs> now a hard start kit uh, can actually work to help get it unstuck in some cases. And what a hard start kit does is a hard start kit applies significant phase shift current to your start winding. So it's basically giving your start winding a big hit of current. Now, is that good for the compressor? Because you hear this a lot. People say, oh, it helps the compressor run the longer life. No, it's, it's not good or bad. It can be good. Because if a compressor is sitting there taking a long time to start and it's running hot for that whole period, then yeah, it's better to get it start, started quicker. So some cases where hard start kits make sense from the factory, using a factory hard start kit, long line applications, 208 voltage in commercial applications. So a cube smart with a long vertical line set makes great sense. You have a lot of refrigerant in that system too, potentially. Um, so hard start kit makes a lot of sense in those applications. For a typical residence with a 25 foot, 30 foot line set, unless the, the manufacturer specs it, some do on hard shut off TXVs, um, then we don't use them. But, and then often we find that they're not necessary even when the manufacturer does spec them. It's one of those areas where the manufacturer specs it, but then they don't provide it, so obviously they don't believe in it too much. You know, it's one of these weird kind of middle zones. But the, the fact is, is that a hard start kit, what it does is it creates a kick of current, or it, it adds a kick of current to the start winding for a short period of time. So, is it a fix to a problem? The answer is, yeah, I mean, if it was supposed to have one in the first place and it didn't have one, then yes. But adding it to a compressor that won't start otherwise when it should be starting, it's not really a fix, it's sort of a band-aid. You, you, it's, like it's like you're kicking it every time in order to get it started. And you know, it may last forever. It may, it may run for 10 more years that way. But it may also fail soon because it may be you know, physically seizing due to poor lubrication, overheating, whatever, some sort of physical failure inside that compressor. So, the only time you put a hard start kit on a compressor, the only time, is when it's seizing. And even then, the type you put in and the way you handle that conversation with the customer depends on the situation. If it was supposed to have one in the first place, then the best thing to do would be to use a factory hard start kit. So for example, train units, their compressors tend to be quite a bit different than other manufacturers, and we, I've had really bad luck using aftermarket hard start kits on trains. Now, I'm being super unscientific here because I haven't really dug into exactly why it is. I could look at the specs on the two and try to figure it out, and I haven't, but I've found... The are a little bit different. It could be the microfarad, it, uh, it could be the voltage of the potential relay that's different, um, but they just tend to have issues, is what I found when you use uh, aftermarkets. <coughs> so if I go to a train, especially one that had a factory hard start in it, I'm not going to just replace that with a kickstart and walk away. Um, but again, you're working on a, you know, a typical unit and it's just, you know, it's having a hard time starting every once in a while. It's going out on thermal overload, which is what tends to happen when a compressor is seized. It will try to start and it'll do the mm, and then shut off. That's going out on thermal overload. That's a time using a hard circuit is appropriate. But just make sure that you're paying attention to the situation because you may leave it on, you may take it off, you may return and put a factory on. And those are things that just depends on the situation. Brand new unit, for example, you know, six months old and it was supposed to have one in the first place because it's a long line set or a hard shut off TXV, then we really should go ahead and put a factory one on uh, rather than just leaving that kickstart. Eight year old unit that you're just trying to get a couple more years out of, slap a kickstart on it and move on. You know, totally different conversation. All right, so that's a locked seize compressor, which is the one I forgot about when I started this class. The next one is the compressor that's not pumping properly. And this is the one that you guys are misdiagnosing the most. This is the one that, that we're having the most challenge with. So what happens when a compressor doesn't pump the way it's supposed to? You can call it not pumping, you can call it poor compression. A lot of people wrongly say bad valves all the time. Every time a compressor's not pumping, it's bad valves. Oh, that compressor has bad valves. 
Well, it could have bad valves if it's a reciprocating compressor. If it's a scroll, I can guarantee you it doesn't have bad valves. You know why? Because the scroll doesn't have valves. Right, exactly. So there's, there's several things that can cause poor compression in a compressor. And we're not, in residential and like commercial, we're not trying to figure out exactly what's wrong because we're not breaking down a compressor and figuring out what's wrong with it like we would with a semi -dramatic. You're not going to rebuild the head on this compressor. So your job isn't to figure out exactly what's going on inside this compressor. Your job is to diagnose, is it poor compression or isn't it? Right? Now, first thing, if you run into, this is the same way of that isolation diagnosis that we talked about before, isolating the compressor, you do it every time. If you run into a diagnosis where you think it's a compressor not pumping, a TXV, or a reversing valve, you have to put it into measure quick. It's a non-optional thing. It's not a, well, I talked to Bert, and he said that my superheat was high and my suction pressure was high, so it's a poor pumping. You have to put it into measure quick because it will slow you down to make that diagnosis correctly. So when you're diagnosing a TXV, a compressor, or a reversing valve, make it your goal to be 100% correct because it's a very expensive and time-consuming misdiagnosis. On top of that, I'll also throw in circuit boards, and um, I had another one in my head. Circuit boards, damper panels, anything that's weird and electronic that you're kind of diagnosing because you've gotten fed up with trying to figure out what's wrong and you just want to get out of there. Uh, when you run into those sorts of expensive, time-consuming repairs, make sure that you're right, and that means slowing down. And with a refrigerant circuit diagnosis, that means plugging it into measure quick. But let's talk about what's going to happen if a compressor is not compressing properly. What's the compressor's job in the first place? What does it do? Compresses refrigerant. Compresses refrigerant. It moves refrigerant. It's what adds the energy to the refrigerant circuit to move the refrigerant through the circuit. Without the compressor, the refrigerant ain't moving, right? So what, we, what do we see in readings in terms of a compressor? We see that our head pressure, also known, the artist also known as our discharge pressure, goes up when our compressor's running, right? And our low side pressure, the artist also known as our suction pressure, goes down when the compressor's running, right? And the more compression we have, the greater the differential there will, there will be. And the less compression we have, the less differential there will be. Proof positive by the fact when a system's not running, your head pressure and your suction pressure, so long as it's equalized, had enough time to equalize, are the same. Right? You've all noticed that. You've all observed that. They're the same. The compressor starts running. Now that differential starts happening. So the first thing you notice in a compressor that's not pumping properly is what? Low head, high suction, otherwise known as poor compression ratio. Compression ratio is just taking your absolute head pressure, your absolute discharge pressure, and dividing it by your absolute suction pressure. That number tells you compression ratio. And when that number is low, it means you don't have as much compression. Now, there's other factors. And so it, you can make a misdiagnosis here. But these are the first things that you notice. And so if it's something other than this, like I've heard guys say, even at Kalos, the compressor's bad. Why is the compressor bad? Well, my suction pressure was low. And so if the compressor isn't working, you're obviously going to see low head pressure and you're going to see high suction pressure. But delineating that from a metering device issue, say a TXV that's feeding too much, overfeeding the evaporator coil, or an extreme case would be somebody has a piston and they fail to put the piston in at all. So it's a, it's a piston system, they fail to put the piston in at all. In those cases, your superheat is going to be low, but with a compressor that's not pumping, generally your superheat's gonna be high. Just keep in mind that if it's an extreme situation where the compressor's really not moving any refrigerant at all, you're, you're also gonna see low superheat because a system that is off with an equalized refrigerant charge has zero superheat because everything is equalized. So. It's kind of a common misconception. For an experienced technician, that's not gonna be a mistake you'd likely make, but for a technician who is just maybe hooking up their probes and looking at a readout, they see zero superheat, and they immediately think, oh, well, the, you know, the evaporator coil is overfeeding. But you can also see zero superheat if the evaporator coil isn't feeding at all. Um, but again, one of the kind of the, the, the common, common sense things you have to look at in terms of compressor diagnosis is, is this compressor not pumping well, or is it not pumping at all? Is it a scroll that's running backwards? Um, something like that. And then of course, in those cases, you're gonna have low superheat. But typically speaking, compressor not pumping, you're gonna see high superheat outside. This is where, if you're, if you're really having a hard time, you get down to 
it's either the reversing valve or the compressor. Okay. I would suggest that you go ahead and pull the refrigerant out, weigh it out, be really thorough at this point. Like, be really thorough because it's going to indicate to you whether somebody's been doing some goofiness. Because you'll even have cases where a compressor's not actually failed, it has poor compression because it's in bypass. And a compressor that's in bypass, it's going to have dang poor compression. Now, generally, you're going to hear it. It'll make that kind of whistling noise. Um, but you want to make sure that it's not just because somebody you know, jacked a bunch of charge in it. One time I had one, an old ream, somebody changed the compressor in it, and they filled the discharge line. So the discharge line was a different size than the compressor they put in. And rather than actually using a, a coupler, they just kind of filled the gap, and a bunch of solder went into the discharge line. And so that compressor would immediately go into bypass. And so it looked like um, it looked like it was a bad compressor, when in reality it was just that the compressor is pushing up against this restriction. Head pressure is building up insanely high. If you have a restricted discharge line, your head pressure that the compressor is seeing is super high. And the key distinction here is, is that we often, we're taking measurements at the, at the ports outside the condenser, and we think that is the measurement. Well, that's not necessarily the measurement the compressor is seeing. And when the compressor is seeing high discharge pressure right here, exceptionally high, it can go into bypass due to that, or overheat, go into thermal overload, whatever. And this is a good kind of general concept, is that be really, really cognizant of what's been done to that piece of equipment. And you can generally observe it as long as you're just paying attention. Like, this compressor looks like it's been replaced. That reversing valve looks like it's been replaced. That TXV looks like it's been replaced. If you're having a recurring problem, it's very possible that that's the cause. And I don't mind in those circumstances having us slow down and even have that conversation with the customer. To just say, okay, it's looking like this, but there's some stuff that's been done here, and um, we may need to kind of take it one step at a time. You know, we need to redo some piping here. Um, I'm gonna need to remove the refrigerant, so this is what that's gonna cost. But we're not gonna really know until we sort of get into this what that's gonna be. Do you want me to go down this path? Um, and having that conversation with a reasonable person, they're generally gonna say, okay, well, what are my other options? So like, the system's 10 years old, maybe I might want to replace it, or the system's three years old, maybe I want to talk to the last person who was here, or whatever they want to do, um, but you want to kind of slow it down. Because again, it doesn't take very many bad diagnoses for us to lose a lot of money and a lot of customer credibility. Because you know, my stance is, that if we make a mistake, we eat it, not the customer. I don't like to hear stories, and if you know of them, then we need to go back and make it right, have that conversation with me or your manager. If we did something that we did wrong by the customer, we made them eat our mistake, then we need to make that right all the time. You, you, you really go down a slippery slope quick when you start justifying those sorts of actions. So don't ever do that. Compressors are expensive, reversing valves are expensive. Now here's another thing I wanna mention about compressors and reversing valves. A reversing valve failure can cause a compressor failure. Why can a reversing valve failure cause a compressor failure? By, compressor's cooled by refrigerant, so if that discharge gas is recirculating down the suction line for a significant period of time, it can cause a compressor failure. So it is possible to have a compound problem. Can a compressor failure cause a reversing valve failure? The answer is actually it can. It's not very common, and we're stretching here a little bit, but if a compressor is failing to the extent that it's throwing material out of it, which it, which it can, you know, like a compressor can actually discharge, it's, it's coming apart inside, it can discharge material down the discharge line which ends up lodged in the reversing valve. The reversing valve is a slide, it looks like a canoe that slides back and forth, and if there's crap that gets in that canoe, um, it, it can cause problems. Just remember, you do not want crap in your canoe, you know? Right. You know, take a, take a bag with you, a cooler, you know? Deal with that mess, bury it somewhere. TXV. Okay, I think I think we've digressed far enough there. Can a failed TXV affect the compressor? Can it fail TXV? Oh yeah, absolutely. Failed TXV can affect the compressor. Either way, it fails. A TXV that's failed open can cause the compressor to slug. A TXV that's failed closed can cause the compressor to overheat. And overheating, uh, in my way of thinking about it, from what I've observed, is actually a more common cause of failure than probably almost anything. Consistently running low on charge, you know. TXV underfeeding, so high superheat, and that's where checking that suction line temperature consistently. Under normal operating conditions, your suction line temperature outside 
it's going to be around 60 degrees. If they're keeping it a little colder inside, then it's going to get a little lower than that. Under normal operating conditions, 60 degrees, um, 55. 55 probably better, actually, in our market. That's a 15 degree superheat and a 40 degree evaporator coil. Depends on, depends on the length of the line. But if you see a system running over 65 on that suction line consistently, that can cause compressor failure. And that can be caused by a TXV that's failing close. So you're doing a compressor. I think it's the point Jesse's getting to. If you're doing a compressor, it's, a, it's a, also a good time to go ahead and do the valve if you don't know. If the compressor's not running, um, and I don't know what your current stance on that is, Jesse. Um, I think it kind of depends on the circumstances. But you don't want to have to keep going back um, when a customer's already spending thousands of dollars for a significant repair. I'm talking about newer compressors, things that are less than five years old. There's a higher likelihood. It's more likely that something, something caused, caused it. it. Yeah, something killed it. Yeah. And that's also a good time. When a compressor is newer, this is more advanced stuff for the senior tech level. When a compressor is newer and it fails, pay attention to what the manufacturer specs say about long line um, rules. So if you've got a you know, 80, 90, 100 foot line set and a compressor went bad within five years, look at what things we should have done with that system initially and go ahead and do that when we replace that compressor. A lot of times it's a factory hard start kit, crankcase heater, um, you know, shut off solenoid, whatever. At that point, it's a good time to just go ahead and do those things uh, because it will prevent problems. Flooded starts and overheating are the two most common causes of compressor failure, um, and that's my opinion. So I'm not, I haven't done a statistical analysis. It'd be a very hard thing to do. Um, but the idea that running, uh, flooding while running is the problem, uh, it, the compressors nowadays are pretty tolerant to a little liquid coming down the suction line uh, compared to what they once were. Um, final thing I want to mention while we're on the topic is a Mager. Um, a Mager is a great tool. If you use a Mager to, in order to check for shorts, that's what it's for. It's not to check for opens. It's not to check for locked compressors. It isn't going to help you diagnose a compressor that's not pumping. So don't do unnecessary tests. I see guys do this a lot. Well, I think it might be the compressor not pumping because whatever. Let's go ahead and make it out. No, no. you do that if you're looking for a short, a hard to find short. But again, for those of you who um, haven't started employing the, you know, what I call the redneck test, that final isolation test, so do that first. Start doing that. Um, you really don't generally need a maker. But if you use a maker, here's the main thing I want to say. You never measure with a maker from leg to leg. Never. Ever. There's no point in doing that test. That's not what a maker is for. Also keep in mind, if you've got the little Supco maker that says bad on it, anybody have this guy? Anybody have this guy? Okay. Just because it says bad don't mean bad. So that's the important thing to know. So the question is, why does it say bad? Well, it says bad because if it's an open winding motor like this one, then a typical open winding you know, compressor uh, application, then it's OK. But on a scroll, it's no good. A scroll is pressed into the shell. It doesn't have suspension. And the windings are really close to the shell. And so it will measure in the low mega ohm range from the windings to the shell just because of the proximity. Everything's closer together inside of a scroll. That's why a scroll can be smaller. So if you use this on a scroll and it says bad and you replace that compressor, you probably replace a good compressor. Got it? Make sense? Okay. So I prefer this guy here. Set it in the 500 volt range and measure to ground. And you'll find a lot of shorts that your typical mega ohm meter or your typical mega ohm meter built into your multimeter isn't going to have the voltage to find, especially when you have like an intermittent one, because it does happen actually. It's not common, but you will have situations where you'll go and it'll be the breaker's tripped, but it's running okay now. And you know, Jesse, that's how Jesse found the uh, that one contactor that was shorted because due to carbon tracing, or tracking, whatever you call it. I kept calling it tracing, and somebody's like, "It's tracking, you idiot!" On one of my videos, people are not nice on videos. Oh, it was first to track. My feelings get so that. hurt all the time. Let me tell you. Let me tell you why. The hours I've spent crying. <sighs> all right. Anything else that we need to cover, Jesse? Anybody? No. Point being, don't misdiagnose stuff. If it's a reversing valve, a compressor, a TXV, a board, a leak in a system, make sure that you're right about it. Just make sure you're right about it and tie. Um, Tie some of your uh, integrity to that.
Like, it's your response to an incorrect diagnosis, I don't want it to be, oh, well, we all make mistakes. That is true. We do all make mistakes. And if it was an honest mistake and you did everything you could do and you made an error, chalk it up to one of those. But I want it to hurt a little. And I'm not saying I want it to hurt a little bit because I want you to have pain. I just know that in order to be a good technician, it has to hurt a little bit. You buy that? You buy that, Bert? Mm -hmm. You hear that you had a bad, di incorrect diagnosis. Your response shouldn't be, well, that guy's an idiot. Your response should be, well, clearly the customer called back. So what did I do? What could I do differently? How can I prevent that? And if somebody brings it to you and says, hey, you, you screwed that up. Your response should be, thank you, sir, may I have another? <laughs> Not specifically, but you should thank them for giving you that feedback. We have to have a culture of feedback, a culture of wanting to do right by the customer. Tie your integrity to it, uh, and I think you'll find that you have fewer callbacks. It should keep you up at night a little bit. Not too much, because I want you to get sleep. Just a little bit, maybe 10 minutes. <laughs> you know, 10 minutes before you go to sleep. Just a little bit of anxiety. Uh -oh. It's a lot more than that. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot more than forget all of this. Don't pay attention. Grant's going to be curled up in a ball at the end of the day. All right. Thank you, guys. Have a good one.